All right, I think that we should be live at this point. So we should be having people join us. Um, I would love to uh, have those of you guys that are joining us now. Um, if you don't mind, put, a, put your name in the chat box. Let us know where you're from. Uh, let us know a little bit about what you came here for. You are with the illustrious panel of um, experts that we have assembled. Uh, everybody that is sitting here in front of you that you guys are seeing is an investor or touches the investment side of our business uh, closely. And um, we're gonna take you guys through what we're calling uh, Real Estate Investing 101. And um, this is the first time we've done this presentation. So bear with us as we go through it. Uh, we have over 75 people registered. So we are expecting a pretty big crowd. Um, at any point in time, you can chime in, you can put your question in the chat box, you can raise your hand, uh, you can use the Q&A box. We've got our amazing marketing specialist, Lauren Miley, monitoring that and Lauren will jump in and interrupt me if I'm talking too much and ignoring your question. So um, thank you guys for, for joining us. So with that said, I'm going to get started and just let's do a quick around the room here um, and just have some quick introductions. So my name is Matt Miali. I run the Miali team at Keller Williams. We're the number one production real estate team in Hartford County. Um, we are uh, consistently selling about 40 or 50 homes a month, um, servicing a large population of investors, um, also servicing a large population of residential homeowners and commercial property investors. Um, you know, really kind of your, your all-in-one, one-stop shop for anything real estate. So uh, we've been in the business, the uh, Miali team's been in business since 2010, uh, and we are um, happy to help you or anybody that you know with any of your real estate needs. So who wants to jump in and introduce themselves? Somebody raise their hand or I'll pick on you. All right, Rob and Rebecca, let's hear from you. Who are you guys? Why are you here? Uh, we are uh, both real estate agents, but we are also investors ourselves. We've represented investors. Um, we've flipped houses and we, we own investment property. So um, we touch a lot of different you guys, facets of the investment. You guys may property. have a little, your, your connection may be a little, did you guys see them sort of spot out a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe you jumped on that that annoying Xfinity um, Wi-Fi that constantly shows up in your house if you have Xfinity Wi-Fi. Not just you guys, mine too. Um, all right, Jason, who are you? What are you doing here? Good afternoon, Matt. So Good afternoon. I am the owner of Ward Killed Off Mortgage, or one of them. Uh, we've been in business since 2006. We do residential lending all throughout Connecticut. Um, Anything that's a, a single family to a four unit, that's um, that's what we do. Residential awesome. financing, mortgages, um, investment, condos, all different types of products, conventional, FHA, government products, VA, FHA, USDA, et cetera. We're, we're going to lean on you to talk to us a little bit about where we can get money and where, where we can get resources if we want to buy property and invest in it. So awesome. Absolutely. All right, Rich, tell us about you. I'm Rich Witt. I'm the owner of the law office of Richard A. Witt. We've got two offices, one in West Hartford Center, one in Plainville, and we handle all of Connecticut, including Fairfield County and Rhode Island. And we work with uh, many, many investors. We set up the limited liability companies, the management companies, uh, the firewalls to hold each property in to uh, keep those liabilities at a minimum. And we'll design a whole plan for you. I've been doing this since uh, 2001 and we handle residential and commercial real estate. Awesome, thank you, Rich, thank you. How about you, Ryan Keating? Hi, everybody, my name is Ryan Keating with the Keating Agency. We're a third generation family, personal lines, uh, insurance brokerage firm here in West Hartford. So we work with many families and clients that have homeowners insurance, car insurance, as well as their rental properties and look forward to kind of touching on when it's better to put a property into a business and business owner's policy than a personal policy. Oh, I think that's a really smart conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. So Bennett, what brings you to the investor seminar? So yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. Um, I've been a, a member of the Miali team going way back and I got into real estate as a would-be investor and um, transitioned into a full-time real estate sales partly because of um, the, a lot of the mistakes I made in the investor side. So I've spent the last 12 years helping to educate my clients and helping them learn from the mistakes that I made. 
and um, have a lot of wisdom, unfortunately, through the School of Hard Knocks, but, um, you know, love to share my wisdom and what I've learned about, especially first-time investors. I'm really good at sort of guiding them. So make, so the first purchase is, is a good one. Yeah, that's a, that's a big part of your business is servicing uh, owner-occupant, first-time home buyers. So I think that's a great a great topic and we will cover that. So, so Eric, how about your, how about your uh, illustrious career? <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, my name is Eric Babbitt. I'm a realtor on the Miali team as well. Um, I've been in business for, I can't even count how long, but I know I've been a landlord since uh, 2003. Uh, I own several properties and have been doing that for quite some time. So awesome. We'll be talking about that, I think. Awesome. All right. So just, just before we get going, we've got a number of attendees here. Just want to comment again. If you guys want to type who you are, where you're from in the chat box, just so I know it's working, that would be awesome. Um, you can use the Q&A button to ask any questions as we get going. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of open this up and tell you guys a little bit about my own personal story. Um, I posted this up on Facebook yesterday. I got a lot of commentary from people. Um, in 2003, I was your standard uh, mid twenties corporate um, corporate guy um, selling national advertising, and I got my hands on a book uh, that was given to me by a friend of mine called "Getting Started in Real Estate Investing." And when I read the book, it became uh, I became enamored by the idea of owning rental property and owning. Um, owning things that could create cash flow and create money that didn't require me to get up every day, put on a suit and tie, because back then I wore a suit and tie every day and go to work. And so uh, fast forward about a year, I bought my first rental property in 2003. It was a three family right here in West Hartford. Um, and um, it, was a, it was a life changer and a game changer for me. That was my intro into real estate. And I often say that's where I went from being interested to committed. And um, that first three family in 2003, um, I, I owned for about 12 years. Um, I sold it in 2015. And in between there, I went from 2003 to 2008 and I went on a mad tear buying a ton of property. And by the end of 2008, I owned 42 apartments in the uh, Hartford and West Hartford area. Um, what happened though, because money was so cheap back then, for those of you guys who remember, was that many of the properties that I bought were heavily leveraged because they would give you money and they didn't necessarily need you to have the income at the time when you were buying them because everybody just assumed real estate will always just keep going up, up, up and rents will keep going up, up, up and there will never be any problems. So like Bennett, I learned some very, very hard lessons in the real estate investing world and I learned them really, really quick. Um, that has made me what I think is a really great asset to help coach and guide people through the process. Um, I continue to invest in real estate. Real estate has been and always will be, I think, the best wealth building strategy that everybody can participate in. And that, that's really the thing that, that very early on, I remember somebody saying to me, if you have $10,000, how much can you invest in the stock market? And my answer was, well, I, I, I assume 10,000. They said, that's right. If you have $10,000, how much can you invest in real estate? Well, that was where the light bulb moment was for me, that I could use that $10,000 as a down payment. And then the bank would give me additional amounts of money to go and buy bigger, more valuable assets that I could then participate in the market at a much higher level. Um, and that was what got me started. So let me get, let me get into our slides here. And like I said, at any point in time, I want you guys to feel free to chime in, ask a question, um, and um, let us know if we're covering something a little too quick. In an hour presentation, there's no way we're going to be able to cover everything. So we're going to do our very best to, uh, to make sure that we cover the most important highlights and then make sure that you reach out to somebody on this call um, to get more information. So the, the point of this is to give somebody who's interested a ground, a foundation for understanding what it is and why you might want to do it. So I do want to thank Jason and Richard too, also, and uh, Ryan for uh, sponsoring this event for us. You guys are always really good at uh, making sure that you bring amazing content to us and supporting our team and our clients as we um, continue to go out there and do things like this. So thank you guys very much. All right, so we've already met the team. So let's talk about what is an investment property. I think it's an awesome question. Um, here's, the, here's the thing, Any, anything that you buy that is in real estate, whether that's a flip, uh, a buy and hold rental property, 
uh, commercial property, um, something, even just raw land. Um, I've got a, a good colleague and friend of mine who invests in property in Vermont and New Hampshire so that he can create maple syrup taps, which he then sells for profit. He buys cheap land with sugar maples on it. So that is an investment property. So anything that you buy that can create some form of income, cash flow, or future value is an investment property. Um, what do you guys think about that? Is there, did I miss anything? Owner occupant, your primary residence. Yeah, your pri actually, it's a great point, Ben. Yeah, your primary residence is a is can can and and in, in, in many cases is an investment property. Actually, great point. All right, biggest question from most people when they say, "Hey, I'd love to invest in real estate," is they ask, "Where where do I start? Like, what's what's step one?" So I'm going to throw that to all of you guys. What do you think step one is, Eric? What's what's the best place to start if you want to get into real estate investing? His mute button broke. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I was trying to do it the quick way and it wasn't working very well. Um, really just sit down. I think you should start with somebody who, you know, who's been there already or is currently in it. Just start talking to somebody who's investing in real estate. Get online, look around, find find an eight. Clearly, clearly you can find an agent, you know, who's invested in real estate. But I think it's just really just start researching it and then you'll figure out how long you want to be in it. Is it something more Rebecca and Rob do where they flip or is it something a little bit more long-term like I'm in the long-term game? I, I actually think that is absolutely brilliant advice. Find a mentor, find somebody to, to lead you through the process. I think that is an amazing piece of advice. Thanks for that, Eric. What, what do you, what do you think, Bennett? What's the, wh where should somebody start? Uh, well, more you can't, use Eric, you can't use Eric's answer. Yeah, no, just, <laughs> I would say looking at a very, very overhead, view of it. Um, there's no get rich quick in anything, especially real estate. So figure out which thing you think you're going to enjoy doing. Um, you know, people think flipping and Rebecca and, and Rob will tell you this. They think, oh, I'll, you know, buy a house for 50 grand, put about 50 grand and sell it for 300. And, um, and there's about 4 million steps in between. So um, that's not for everybody. So pick something that you think you're going to enjoy doing. I think that's a, again, another great piece of advice. Like if, if you're not in the, if you're not going to be comfortable asking a tenant for their rent check, you probably shouldn't be a landlord because that's inevitably part of the job. Yeah. I think that's great advice. What do you guys think, Rob and Rebecca, where, where's the best place to start? So I think uh, sort of piggybacking on what Bennett said, um, I think the key is to figure out what it is that your goals are. What, what, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to make um, short-term money, long-term money? Are you trying to establish passive income? Uh, are you looking for? Are, are you want? Do you want to do it full-time or part-time? You know, there's a whole bunch of uh, you know different ways you can do this. So and you're, you're saying, you know, Rebecca and I have spent a lot of. You're saying start with a goal. Create, create a clear, create clarity about what you're trying to accomplish. I think that's exactly. A, I think that's a really, really good, another piece of great advice. What, what I would add to that is, you know, I think the best place to start is really number one, make sure that you've got really good income and that your personal income is not going to be reliant upon what this property is going to throw off. Like, I think that is another thing that, that often amateur investors um, brand new investors overlook is how important their own personal income to support their family is before they make an investment. And that the upside of the investment should be um, in addition to what you've already got built. It should not be reliant on it because there is inherently risk in anything. And so if you're going to enter into the property investing game, you need to make sure that your baseline is strong and that your foundation is strong. So um, the other thing that I, you know, none of us mentioned here, but the best way to get started, if it, and again, this is driven by your life situation, but if you are in a place in your life where at least 50 or 60% of your friends are living in apartments or small condos, the absolute best first thing to do is go buy a multifamily property and live in one unit. Rich, you were talking about that before we got started here. What, what are what do you want to add to that? Well, you know, I have clients who come, you know, wanting to live in West Hartford, want to live in Avon, want to live in Farmington, and 
they're looking at the prices and they're saying, I just don't see the return on investment that I normally do. And I tell them, I go, you got to live somewhere. You want to, a lot of them are in their thirties. They want to live in the center or near the center or with an Uber. And I say, get a two family because at least, at least 50% of your mortgage is going to be covered um, principal interest taxes and insurance by the tenant. And so even if you're paying 400, 450 for something on say Brace or Whitman, um, you're really getting that unit for about half the price at the end of the 30 year term. Yeah. So you can't just look at the price. You have to look at what that tenant contribution is going to be over the long haul of, of all your expenses, income versus expenses. I actually think this is one of the most brilliant parts of real estate investing is that if you, you, you have to live somewhere if you can live somewhere and have half of your mortgage paid by someone else over the course of the time that you live and own that property, your principal balance will go down by double. It will go down twice as fast yep. as it would if you just lived in a small single family home, which is partly why the best advice that everybody that anybody could ever get when they're in your early 20s thinking about buying your first property is, or, or rather, the best rule that should go out is don't ever buy a single family until you've already bought a, a multi, right? And then just use that multi to, to launch your, your life from that point. And you immediately start building wealth at a young age. It's like the, the Warren Buffett advice, which said, you know, invest $10,000 for all of your kids on the, on the day they're born. And that 10,000 by the time they're 45 is going to be like 1.5 million or some absurd mm -hmm. number. Somebody can look that up. Fact check me because that's definitely not accurate, but it's something like that. So um, awesome. Thank you for that, Rich. Yeah, Matt, one other thing I wanted to just add real quick is uh, I did a, a, a closing one time for a mailman and I was covering for another attorney and I noticed he was 48 years old and he had 18 units. Hmm. I asked him what happened and he said, I got out of the service and he said, I knew I couldn't do the maintenance. So he started what he could afford was one bedroom units in nice complexes. And he slowly moved up to two bedroom units and that's where he peaked, but he just bought one a year starting when he got out of the service around 28 years old. By the time I met him at, I think he was 46 or 47, he had 18 units, Matt. And he didn't have to handle the maintenance because he had the condo association do it. And he just, again, one and two bedrooms, but that's all he wanted the responsibility for, but it was just slow and steady and it was really inspirational. And the brilliance of that over 18 years that first property that he bought, that maybe he bought with 5% down right, or less. Right? right, exactly. By the time 18 years had passed, he owned in equity more than half of it. And, and at that point, maybe he'd even paid it off, right? Like, but, yep. but the, the, it's, it's just, it's a long-term strategy, which is, which is absolutely brilliant. Super. Yeah, he well. never broke his rule. He only bought one a year. That's all he did. That's all he did. I, I love, I love that. I love that. There's a picture of our team. There's our presenters. I guess I was presenting a little bit out of order here, guys. So um, there's our sponsors. There we go. Uh, that's what investment probably just talked about that. So a um, couple other things here. So why invest in real estate? So um, what about real estate versus the stock market? So I mentioned that earlier. I remember hearing like, what can you invest in the stock market if you have $10,000 versus what you can invest in real estate? Historically, you know, the stock market is an absolute long-term play, right? If you invest in the stock market and you keep your money in there, you, the, you know, we know that over a long enough period of time, based on our track record, that the stock market is going to increase the value of your home. One, what are some of the other reasons why real estate is a great vehicle to invest in versus the stock market? Okay, what do you guys see as, as value? I think a big part of the difference is that the stock market, depending on the stocks you choose, may or not may or may not have income related to them, right? There's the, the growth aspect of it. Right. You only make any money when you actually sell them. Yep. Real estate, if you have investment real estate, you can achieve both. You can have cash flow over the life of the ownership and you can also sell it and you know have the actual asset itself when you decide to sell. And, and and you can get a loan paid off by someone else's rent money, right? Yeah, and and then the other thing is that what are the tax advantages to making money in the stock market? Oh, that's right. There's none. That's that's right. You don't make any. Yeah, there are no tax advantages to making money in the stock market, right? So you can invest in your four hundred one k, but you're limited to do twenty one thousand a year or something like that. You can do a Roth IRA, but it's like sixty six hundred. There's a lot of rules around limiting how much money you can put in the stock market. 
but there are no rules around how much money you can invest in real estate. And there are massive tax advantages, tax credits, benefits to writing off certain parts of your, you know, if, especially if you live in the property. So there's a, a lot of upside, obviously consult with an accountant on that, but um, the tax advantages to owning rental property are pretty significant. So um, the long-term returns over real estate investing are, you know, generally if you have the runway and you can hang on to any property long enough, you will have a great return. Um, and obviously the diversification, and I, I'm going to dig into that a little bit, diversification in real estate and is not just about, well, I've got my 401 and I've got real estate. You can do a lot of different things in real estate. You can own different subsets of types of property from condos like Rich talked about to multifamily properties that are residential multis like three and two and four units, also to large commercial property like strip malls. The real estate offers lots of different ways to structure your investment that ha all have benefits and risk strategies that make them make sense. So anything to add here, guys, what's, what's another reason or something we haven't covered? Why would you want to invest in real estate? Anything that I missed? Well, just the real estate, a house is a tangible object. You know, right. stock can just poof, disappear. And as far as I know, techno I mean, technology is going to advance, of course, but people are always going to need a roof over their head. So, you know, it's a physical structure that, you know, and it's protected from insurance, you know, from, you know, from a you know, fire or something, you've got insurance. So it, it's just something that you can always, you know, feel and touch. And it's something that, you know, people always need a place to live. I think that is, that's, it's interesting, it's interesting you brought that up. Like that is probably one of the things that has always attracted me to real estate as an investment vehicle is that once you own it, it's yours. It's there. There's dirt under the ground. Like that house belongs to you. Like there's a, there's a real asset there that's never, ever going to be worth zero, right? Like there's, it's never going to go to zero. Stocks can go to zero. That can absolutely happen. We remember a company named Enron, right? That was a situation where the stock went from something to zero. Didn't matter how much you owned, zero is zero. So great point, Bennett. Well, so I was, I was going to add similarly that, uh, you know, population is not going down. Population right. keeps going up. So yeah, there's the old, there's the old adage, Ryan, right? That buy land, they're not making any more of it. Yeah. Right. And, and that is, that is spot on. And, you know, again, on, on some often like walk through like large multifamily developments and, you know, or I'll, I'll be with a, a friend of mine and, you know, maybe we were in some big commercial development, half the, half the units are empty. Right. And the person will go, God, you know, how, how can they own this with half of them empty? And it's because, well, they didn't buy them for today, right? Those large commercial developers, right? Those investments are intended for decades, generations even, right? And your runway on some, site, on some timeline of events will always give you a return um, as long as you can afford to keep the property and pay for the asset. So, all right, where to start? So I think we covered a little bit about this, but um, the very first thing that you have to get really clear on, and I'm going to, you know, kind of toss this to Jason too, to, to kind of hear what, is Jason still here? Or we lose him. I think we lost Jason. I am here. Where are, oh, where'd you go? Oh, you were hiding behind something. All right. Yeah. Um, so one, one of the things that we want to do when we get started is we want to have a really good, clear picture of our personal financial situation, right? So we often, right, get some, get people to call our team and they say, I want to get started in real estate investing. And we go, that is awesome. Let's talk about your income. Let's talk about what you're looking to do. And we get into a analysis and they go, well, I'm going to be a full-time real estate investor. And we'll ask them what they're starting with. They say, well, I don't have anything yet. So Jay, What's the, what, what are banks lending money? Like, how do they feel about people that don't have income? Well, you definitely, you definitely need to have income. Okay. All right. So that's the, <laughs> that's the first thing, right? You got to have income. What about 0% down payment loans? What's available out there for that? N nothing on the investment end of it. Nothing on the investment end of it. Right. So if you're not buying a property to live in, um, what is the lowest amount of down payment that you can put down to purchase a property? You can do an, a single family investment with 15% down. 15%, what about a multifamily? Multi is gonna be 25 typically. 25% if you're not- but There are that. some cases where we could get a multi two to four unit done at, you know, at 80% loan to value, 20% okay. down. 
So I guess the point that I'm simply making is that you have to, as an investor, have absolute clarity about what the barrier to entry is. Back when I started, they asked if I had a heartbeat. They handed me a mirror, held it under my nose, and they said, how much do you want? And I said, how much can I get? And they said, depends on what you write on this paper. That Those days are gone, right, Jay? There's no longer loans like that. What do they call them? No income, no job, no assets. Ninja loans, right? Yeah, there's, I mean, there was just some, you know, things out there that weren't suitable to sustain economic changes, you know, and mm -hmm. There are some variations of those left, but you'll find it in the investment world, it's almost like a graduated thing, right? If, if you're gonna like look for an option where they'll let you state or they'll, they'll give you the money based on what the projected rental income is, they're not gonna do that for somebody that's just starting off, right? They're not gonna do it for a first time home buyer. They're not gonna do it for someone that's not experienced in real estate investing. So I find a lot of people that have some interest in this We'll usually start off with, uh, you know, a multifamily, but they're going to live in a unit, right? And something like that you could do and get into with three and a half percent down. I mean, again, where else can you invest three and a half percent of the total investment value, gain all of the benefits of rental income, cash flow, paying down the principal and living there? And in some cases, you can buy a property like a three family, you can get a three and a half percent FHA mortgage, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, for up to four units. Is that right? Yes. It's amazing. So, so if you could identify a four unit property, move into one apartment, rent three and have your entire mortgage paid by the three incomes coming in, does the bank have any problem with that? No. No, they actually love that, right? They, they really like, that's like, that's the free rent deal. Like you own it. You put the three and a half percent down and then you get to live there for free. Right. I, I don't know what better deal there is. I, I've never, I'm still in my 45 years on this earth, have not heard of a better deal. There being is. Offered. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, Rob, you brought this up earlier. You want to choose a specific real estate investing strategy. I think this is another really important one. Um, Rob, what's your take on somebody that wants to flip a house that doesn't currently live in or has never bought a rental property? Um, that's fine. What's that? That's fine. That's fine? Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, All right. Rock and roll. I, I you know, my, my thought would be that somebody getting into investing, right, is flipping like, a great way to start? Like, do you think that's a good first foray into owning real estate? So, I mean, I, um, sure. That's, that's okay. a good Rob, way to start. Rob's saying, let's go. All right. Absolutely. Let's roll. Yeah. I mean, I'm, leaning, I'm just leaning them a different I mean, way, but that's okay. I mean, let's hear I, I mean, it like I it depends. I mean, what, you know, who are you? Right. I mean, if you're a contractor, uh, if you have a lot of contacts in that world, that might be a good way to start. Um, I think a, I think the best way to start real estate investing is buying a three family or four family and having your tenants pay for your, your rent where you live and then sort of bounce from there. You know, you and I both know many people have done that multiple times. Um, you know, we were talking about the once a year thing. So, you know, we know people who once a year by a two family, a three family, a four family, right? Yeah. And uh, keep going. That's that's a really good way to build wealth. Uh, also a long-term flip is a good way to do it. You could just buy a property. That, Especially right now. Like a, right? Especially yeah, like right a now, what we, know, what we know about inventory in the market, that inventory is at an all time low and likely to stay that way for at least another eight months to two and a half years, depending on what, you know, how deep the well is for urban migration to our area. Now is a great time to buy a, buy a property, renovate it, hold it, and then plan on selling it sometime in the next year or so as prices continue to increase. So that's, a, a, I think, great advice. Great advice. Um, one of the things and that- I think with a single family home too, if, if you're willing to buy a house that needs work, and put the sweat equity in. Um, that's another way that you can sort of contribute to your wealth profile without having cash, right? If you have enough to buy the house, 
and you're willing to live in a house that's under construction for a couple of years and put your time, effort, and energy into renovating the house, you know, that might be an okay first flip, right? I you actually have, I, have to be I, willing I, to put in the time. I love that advice, Rebecca. You know, the, the, the market right now is such that if a property comes on the market and it's in great shape and has been renovated, how fast does it sell? Like very fast <laughs> immediately. Right. But what about the, the ugly ducklings that are out there? They still sit. They still sit for a while, which means that, you know, those are the, that's the spot where you can go get yourself a deal, even in a market like this, if you are willing to do what Rebecca said, go in, roll up your sleeves, break some things, tear some stuff apart, do some work, hire some people, save your money and invest. And that could be a great living situation for, you know, one to three years. And while the market increases, that can be a great first opportunity. I think that's a really, really good advice. Hey, Matt, I just want to, you know, my wife and I were just out driving around a couple of weeks ago and we saw the, you guys, um, I represent a lot of the clients who bought on Ringgold and you guys had a beautiful older bungalow, fairly yeah. priced on a dead end by the cemetery. And I think it was 215 or 225. And anybody with sweat equity, that, that house had so much upside. It was just a... Uh, Absolutely. amazing to me and it was on a cul-de-sac you know yep. it was a, you know and and it was uh, off the beaten path and i'm not sure people were looking at it but i'm sure it was under under deposit but i just told my wife there's just you put a little sweat equity into something like that you've really got something you got to actually derek banka from our team got that listing put it under contract in in i think it was less than three or four days that went under pretty quick but it was a, a great example of exactly what rebecca's talking about property with a lot of upside. And in fact, I believe the buyer profile for that property does fit that. It's somebody that's going to go in and roll up their sleeves and do a little bit of work. So yeah, great um, listing, great listing. Yeah, great, great opportunity. And they're out there, guys. You know, the thing is, is that we, we often get consumed by the, uh, you know, by the headline and by the, you know, the, the conversation, oh, there's nothing to buy. There's not, that's not true. There are deals out there. You just have to be willing to parse through the bright and shiny and go find the one with some warts on it and uh, go fix them, go fix that stuff. And that's it. That's an, a massive upside. So, um, all right. So can I, you, Matt, can I add to that? Yeah, of course. Please. Yeah. So piggybacking on what, you know, Rob and Rebecca said, and I'm also glancing at, you know, one of the questions in the chat box is about a two or three K rehab loan. Um, right. So I guess, you know, what I would add to that is it's all about resources and what resources you have. So resources could be cash. So it could be uh, our ability to borrow money. And it could be what Rob said, which is, you know, if you're a contractor and you have skill and know-how. So a lot of which investment strategy you pick depends on your resources. So the reason we typically say multifamily is because most people starting out don't have cash. So when you live in a multifamily, that's the best opportunity to leverage the resources of the bank and not have to use your own resources. Um, but if you have, so for the, but the smaller percentage of people that do have skill and, you know, in, in carpentry or whatever, or like Rebecca said, just a willingness to say, hey, it's my first house, let's have fun. Let's, let's break some things, let's do it. Um, you, that's, you know, it's a smaller subset of people that wanna do that, but it all comes down to what resources you have. And, and the resources could be anything from cash to, to skill to, to leverage. I think that is a great, a very articulate way to describe it. And, and you're spot on. Everybody comes to the table with a different skill set. So um, that's awesome. And that obviously feeds your, your specific real estate investing strategy. I, you know, the, the, the financing part of this, Jason, when somebody's looking to invest, and one of the questions is pretty timely, um, Devante asked, you know, what about 203K? What are some pros and cons about that? And, and you know, I've got my opinion, which I'd love to throw in, but what do, what do you think about 203K, Jason? What's, uh, how, how, how successful is that program for uh, real estate investors? Well, we do them all the time, right? Not, you know, it's an owner-occupied product, FHA, right? So you can do it well, on number a one, Number one, it's owner-occupied. So right. for 203K, you've got to be willing to move into the property. <clears throat> and it is FHA, which means it's a federally backed and insured loan. So your lender is going to be, they're going to be, um, the, the property is going to be scrutinized to FHA standards by your lender and the appraiser. Right. The borrower is not going to be able to do any of the work in that situation. So oh, the benefit okay. of the sweat equity is going to go away. You're going to have to have licensed contractors do all the work in that situation. 
So the benefit there is that if you want to borrow the money for 203K, you actually have to pay retail pricing to get the work done. And, and in some cases, the retail pricing may eliminate the upside of the investment overall, because by the time you make that retail pricing, you're not really saving any money on the sweat equity unless you buy it cheap enough. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a really good answer. It's always important to try to make your money like on the way in on that because. Yeah. You really got to make sure you get the right price. But one thing I would just say though, in a market like this, where we have low inventory and some property sitting, right. And it's so competitive just to get in the door, a 203k loan for an owner occupant could be a really good strategy to go and pick up one of those properties that no one else wants at a discount price and then get the value out of it that you want to get when you're, when you're done with it. Right. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a really good, great question, Devante. Thank you. Jason, I got a question. Do you need a down payment on a two to three, four family on a VA? I know on a single, you don't, but on a multi, do you need a down payment on a VA uh, multifamily? No, we've done them hundred percent before. Wow. Okay. That's another great question. So if you are a veteran and qualify for a VA, you can actually go buy an investment property with zero money down. What about um, USDA loans in that environment, Jay? Can you buy a multifamily with a USDA? Um, I'd have to look into that. I haven't done one of those in a while, and I know that changed recently, but I can get back to everybody on that for sure. So my advice to everybody watching here is if you want the zero down payment, no money down, free rent deal, call Jason, let him figure out what you qualify for, then call one of us on the team, and we'll help you line up a property that meets the needs. But Every, there are a lot of loan programs out there that are designed to help people get started in this. And just like Rebecca said, and Rob and Bennett and Eric, one of the best ways to get started is to go in and make an investment in a property that you plan to occupy for some period of time. That is, that is definitely a really great first step into real estate investing. So, um, all right. So we've covered a lot of this stuff. We talked about passive income, growth potential, stability, predictability, increasing value. Um, any other, you know, pros of owning real, rental property? I mean, I think we let we left off tax advantages. What about like vacation rental? I mean, I think that's another one that that you know that's something that's become really really hot. Um, I've got a client right now looking at a property that's for sale. Um, down on the shoreline that generated $60,000 in rental income last year um, as an Airbnb, strictly through Airbnb. That is a whole new niche of income property that has shown up in the last five years. Um, that means that even rooms in your house that are unused can suddenly become income producing. Um, that's another, like, I don't have any personal experience with that. Um, but that's another way where, you know, early on, early investing, you could put a room on Airbnb and create income out of a room or maybe an extra, uh, you know, a finished basement or something like that. Any thoughts on that, guys? Just say, good idea, Matt. That's all. I think that's a separate webinar. It's such a new thing that I think um, that's something that um, is up still. A lot has to be sorted out with the legalities and the zoning on that. So. I yeah, think that's a great untapped thing that's going to just get bigger and bigger. Yeah. If you guys, um, if, if some of you guys here uh, watching this would like to see us do a webinar on Airbnb and VRBO, just put your, uh, put your name in the chat box and we'll, um, we'll I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to invite some, some experts that have, that have done that at a high level to come and join us on the next seminar. Yeah, Matt, uh, I do have to add that certain towns, like I believe Narragansett, Newport, if the rentals are Airbnb below seven days, they're now charging like a sales tax on those as well, mm -hmm. um, which takes it out of a rental situation into you literally have to pay a weekly sales tax. And um, in Boston, unless the building's a one unit is owner occupied, you can't even do Airbnb in Boston, unless that's a four Yeah, so again, some unit. of these local municipalities are definitely, you know, changing their, their rules around it. Um, yeah. And I think it's a you know, I, it's great, great context, Rich. I think that's also like what we saw initially when Uber showed up in certain right. cities, right? Uber showed up, they disrupted the way that the market worked. All of a sudden the cities were passing kinds of legislation, right? I remember one, one year I was in Austin, Texas and I was taking Uber everywhere. And the next year I was there, it was like, Uber's illegal. It was like, <laughs> what, what happened? How did Uber become illegal? It's like, oh, the city council said, you can't do Uber anymore. You got to take taxis. And I was like, that's just confusing. Um, 
anyhow, um, so, you know, moving on. So, you know, profits and investment properties. So, Eric, you're, you're the, you know, resident um, multifamily. You've got a great portfolio. Talk to us about rental income. What, what does it take to, to manage a portfolio of properties and have rental income? Uh, well, again, you got to start somewhere like um, we've been talking about moving into as your first uh, first place, move into a multifamily. That's essentially what we did. Um, we were living in an apartment. We actually, the, the quick side story was we were visiting friends that were living in an apartment and see them in a while. And we're like, oh yeah. He's like, I got to fix something. I'm like, wait, just have your landlord do it. He's like, no, we own it. And he was telling us the story of how the downstairs unit paid for the whole mortgage. They're buying another house and that the upstairs unit is going to pay for that. So we just, that's the way we started. Um, you I were like, I want that deal. That's yeah, we, we, we were driving home like we're doing that. So our first place, <laughs> I think going owner occupied, we were paying $200 a month on our mortgage. Um, that's all we, you know, with the rent that was upstairs, um, that we got for upstairs, we were only paying $200 a month. And we said, let's go do this again. And we'll, you know, we'll start making money off of it. And so our goal was simply to never pay for, never pay for a mortgage again. And we did, that included our, you know, single family home. So in terms of gaining rental income, um, you know, you got you just really got to get in there and start. It's, you're going to do well, like Rich said, um, you know, when he was talking about the West Hartford property, somebody is going to pay the majority of your mortgage, which is great. It's, would you lose power, Matt? Someone turned off the lights in the office. <laughs> I just saw that. It distracted me. So That's amazing. That's awesome. All right. Um, Keep so, talking about it, Eric. I'm going to go okay. turn the lights on. And yep. then Rob and Rebecca, I want you guys to jump in and talk about fix and flip. And I'll be right back when the lights are on. Yeah. And we started basically with a two family. And from there, we said, okay, if we do one more. So you just got to get in there. You're either going to save a tremendous amount of money and build some equity that someone else is paying for, or if you want to get to that passive income, a few more are going to help you along the way. That's what I would tell you is basically that, you know, the more you have, the, the quicker it gets. But and then in the long-term game, Matt talks about a runway is that original rent that I started with in that first apartment um, cause I've been doing it so long is 70, I get 75% more in rent than when I first started. So along with prices going up, rents go up as well. So it's been, uh, I'm cash flowing a lot better now. Does that make sense? Rob, all you buddy. Absolutely. Cool. So, um, I'm not sure what he wanted me to talk about in terms of flipping. Um, well, I, I think what, one of the things that we would share is that the, the first flip we did was um, we thought we did our research, right? We bought a single family uh, HUD house and we had a budget and we had all these wonderful plans. And um, we thought, again, we thought we did our research. It, it took us, I think, four times longer than we thought it would. Um, budget obviously was more than we thought it was. Um, so, I, you know, my first caution is don't watch HGTV and think that's how it goes. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I always tell people what you do is you go in, make sure you get your ARV down, you know what your exit price is, do your research on that, uh, get your contractors in there, uh, make sure you know your rehab budget, you know, right down to the penny, um, close on the property, go in there, throw all that stuff in the garbage, <laughs> and you own it now. Well, Rob, Rob, you, now you, it's yours. Like you Matt said. A term that not everybody might be familiar with. You said ARV. What, what is ARV? So that's a, a, after repair value. After repair so, value. Okay. So, am, so you, you buy it. It needs a ton of work. You have a budget to fix it. It could be 50 or or $100,000. And after you get done fixing it up, and it looks like HGTV, uh, then you sell it. And yeah, so you my, to know my, what the market's going to be. My favorite, so it, my that's favorite. one of the tricks right now, Matt, by the way. Yeah. One, my, one of the challenges now in this, this market, ever since COVID hit, you know, what's it going to, it takes a little bit longer to rehab a property now because of COVID. Um, all the materials are up. All the contractors are busy. And so in 
it usually takes you say two, three, four months to rehab a property. Now it's a little bit more. What's the market going to be eight, eight months from now, six months from now? It's not only the, right? the, the, the supplies that are slowing down, it's the permitting process in each of the towns too. I mean, right. everything is slower. So in a fix and flip, you really got to be, I, I would say you've got to go very cautious on the after repair value. And I, again, for a first time investor. So obviously on this call, we've got several people that are professional real estate agents and professional investors. Make sure if you're going to buy a flip that you get a second opinion. If you are, if you are an amateur in that, you know, maybe you've done this once or twice, or you are not tied to the market as closely as some of us are, get an opinion on what that ARV is. Cause you do, if you miss that, one of the things that people, people screw up, this is why fix and flip can be very dangerous is that, um, well, let me just ask anybody want to throw out a guess or some of you guys know how, how much have prices gone up in the last year in Connecticut? Roughly how much has median sales price gone up? Come on. You guys know we go through this, right? About 30%, 30%. So median sales price has increased about 30% just this year, wow. which is unbelievable, right? But it can go the opposite way in the same amount of time. And so if you buy a property and you're expecting a 20% profit margin and the value drops 30% in the amount of time that it takes you to get from acquisition to sale, you not you lost your profit with due to no fault of your own. Market conditions will drive that sale price way more than any backsplash you put in. Way more. Market conditions and timing are going to have a much bigger impact on what you can sell that home for, you know, beyond the cabinets and the and the hand poles and the light fixtures. So people often get into fix and flip because they're excited about the design aspect of it. But if you don't have a number cruncher in your corner, you can go wrong in a big way. And that's a, that we saw that happen. Those of us that were in the market, 2007, 2008, even into 2009, the people that were really late to the game were picking up properties because they were used to an appreciating market. An appreciating market where prices are going up is the right kind of market to try and find dirt cheap properties because you know that there's forgiveness in it. But when the market turned, people were buying properties at a price and then the next day it was worth less and the next day it was worth less. And the amount of time that it takes to get it from where it was into its best condition, you lost the value that you planned on making as profit. That's that we saw that happen to a lot of people. So it's really important to have clarity about what that final investment number is going to look like. So um, anything else to add, guys, on these two topics, rental and fix and flip? Well, well, Matt, on a bigger picture, back to 2007, you know, I was representing a subdivision and you and I would have both looked at it and said, this is rock solid. It was in a great town and it was going to be 55 homes, 50 homes, I believe. And but unfortunately, we ran into roadblock after roadblock, as Matt would say, on the permitting. And then when we get through that, we went into wetlands. And then literally it was knocked down repeatedly and we kept on winning unanimously. By the time after 18 months, we got it approved unanimously. The market went from super hot in 2006 when we started to the crash happened right when we got our approval. So the rug was pulled underneath from our developer who did really nothing wrong except for ran into regulatory um, stoppages and it, it delayed the project by about 10 months, 12 months, you know, wait more than we expected. Yeah. The, sometimes the biggest mistake you can make is being the wrong person in line at the wrong time. Right. And that's just the reality. And so, you know, my, my investment story was very similar in that the biggest acquisition that I made, I closed in May of 2008. I had put it under contract in November of 2007. In between the time that I put it under contract and the time I closed, Enron, stock market crash, Lehman Brothers, all of those things happened cascading in events, but I was too young and didn't have the right guidance to say, you know what, I got to walk away from my $25,000 deposit in order to save myself from what turned into about five years of pain of buying a property that was not worth what it was worth the day that I bought it. 
Um, so we've often very, very important part of this equation in buying rental properties to make sure you have clarity about your exit strategy and clarity about trends in the market. And the way that you do that is you plug into somebody who's a professional, who's in the market all the time, looking at the numbers. So anybody from our team, we look at our numbers every Monday. So anyone here can give you stats and support it with uh, supporting documentation around where, what trend, where the trends are. The good news is right now I can give you the overview. The trends are good. It's a good time to get into real estate. So, um, Bennett, you had a comment? Yeah, so you know, comparing those two things is a good, the analogy I would use is, you know, if you go to a financial advisor, um, when you're, you know, just say a young couple goes to a financial advisor and, and the fir- one of the first things they're gonna say is, what is your risk tolerance? And so those are two great examples. So if you are a high risk individual, then fixing and flipping is the way to go because along with big reward is also big risk. So you may make 30 grand, you may lose 30 grand. There's a big swing there. If you say, you know, I'm more conservative, he might, your financial guy might put you in an index fund or a Roth or all these these very safe things that aren't going to make a ton of money, but they're very safe. So, you know, the the multifamily, especially the one you live in is a very low risk. You know, again, that 10,000, you can put 10 grand into it. You've got a roof over your head. So, you know, it's, it's, you may not make a ton of money, but you're not very unlikely going to lose your shirt at worst case scenario is you have a place that you, a roof over your head that you live in. So a lot of it is just risk tolerance. Is making Absolutely. I think that's a really awesome way to summarize here, Bennett. Um, thank you for that. So, so it's been about an hour. And if you believe it, we've been, we've spent an hour talking about real estate investing. We have scratched the surface, which is why this is the 101 class. Every one of these topics, whether it's fix and flip, multifamily investing, Airbnb, VRBO, vacation rental, um, commercial investing, any we could do an hour webinar, we could do a half day seminar on every single one of those. So here's what I'm going to recommend for anybody that's watching now. If you're interested in learning more about real estate investing, if you want to talk to one of the professionals on this call, um, I want you to please feel free to reach out to us. I'm going to jump down. Here we go. Here's our Uh, Here's everyone's contact info here. Feel free to write it down, call us, put your name or number in the chat box and somebody from the team will reach out to you. Um, We are here and happy to help. Um, And, you know, there's no commitment on that. I just want to be super clear. We're not looking to sell people houses that aren't going to work for them. If you are just, uh, you know, dabbling, curious, interested, reach out and somebody on this call will be happy to coach you and counsel you through it. Um, I want to thank uh, Ryan Keating from Keating Agency for coming. Ryan, we didn't get to talk about insurance. So before we wrap up, let me let me throw it to you and tell me, tell me, Ryan, like inside of the world of buying investment property, what are some common insurance pitfalls that people get into? Uh, one, of, one of the biggest things on a multifamily is lead paint. So oh, if it's not going to be owner occupied yeah. with a lot of, and that's usually a mediation that has to happen before or within shortly after closing. Um, The recommendations too from insurance companies. So you might be able to get a policy put into place. And then when they do their inspection, they'll see things that are risks per se that they recommend um, get remediated or fixed. Um, Even though they call them recommendations is more, you must do this or your policy will cancel. Um, Those are just kind of two of the quick quick things and then also replacement cost um properties multifamily properties apartments in the hartford area that are built out of concrete brick stone you might be able to acquire those for a low cost but the actual replacement cost of those might be double triple oh, so the, what the you, insurance so it's important uh, you know I, it's very important for people to have clarity about what their insurance costs are going to be on any of these acquisitions and rob and rebecca it's probably it's probably always a number that you sort of clench your fists and, you know, like, you know, cower your head as you're about to hear how much the insurance is going to be on a flip property that's going to be unoccupied and under construction. Uh, are there expenses when you do a flip? Like all, the TV shows, all the TV shows I watch, they don't talk about those. They don't talk about the carrying cost of the insurance and uh, right, right, exactly. And yeah. even yeah. owner occupants, um, a lot of insurance companies look at oh, at multifamilies different as like it's a commercial building. So you want to make sure your insurance provider knows the subtleties difference and doesn't charge an, a two family owner occupant 
the price that a commercial insurance uh, person might charge you. So I know Ryan can you know walk you through the differences between. Uh, just make sure you know they under he understands that it's a different, slightly different animal than what a lot of insurance companies are familiar with. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Uh, so again, Ryan, thank you for bringing that bringing that up. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sponsoring, Richard. Thank you again, as always. Love your input, um, Jason. Thank you very much, um, you. guys. Everybody that's here today. Thanks for your contributions. I think this has been great. This is Real Estate Investing 101. Um, deep, for a deep dive, we're probably going to do this as a you know an ongoing series here and uh, bring in some additional experts around some of the different topics. So make sure if you're watching this that you go to the Miali Team Mastermind page and plug yourself in there to um, just go and go ahead and like that page on Facebook. We're gonna be posting all of our webinars and seminars there. Make sure that you go to the Miali team uh, page where we post all of our properties for sale. We post regular stats and, and market updates. Uh, make sure that you like that so that you can get updates from our team. Um, we're on every other platform, Instagram and all those too. Um, but thanks again, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Rob, Rebecca, Eric, Bennett, everybody. Um, make it a great night. Enjoy yourself um, and uh, make a plan. Go buy something. It's a good time to start. Thanks, Matt. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Matt.